Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone. Let's get started. So today is essentially our last lecture in which we will cover new content. Uh, today is the third lecture on secure multi-party computation and uh, we will cover what is known as Yao's garbage circuits. And next week, uh, we will mostly focus on like maybe some homework problems, office hours and so on. So recall that what have we seen so far in, in secure multi-party computation? So we have seen a protocol uh, which works as long as one of the inputs is small, right? And that was a protocol for the semi-honest uh, setting. And <coughs> last time we also saw how to use coin flipping and zero knowledge proofs to uh, go to the fully malicious setting as well. But what if, uh, you know, both the inputs are large. As an example, let's say I have a database, you have a database, and maybe we are trying to, you know, run some machine learning algorithm on our joint data set, right? So in that case, of course, the database might be larger, both the databases might be large, and uh, it may not be possible to sort of exhaustively list all possible outputs. So in that case, Yao's garbage circuits will help you. Right, so, um, so Yao's garbage circuit, as the name suggests, it was proposed by Andrew Yao, who also introduced the notion of secure two-party computation in that paper. And then later on, the construction was sort of generalized to the case of multi-party. So for now, you know, we will stick to the case of two parties. So we have, we have two parties, P1, and P2, let's say having inputs X1 and X2, and they are trying to run some kind of protocol at the end of which they will run F of X1 comma X2. So that's uh, sort of the problem that we want to solve uh, today, right? And the protocol should be such that it doesn't reveal anything except uh, the output F of X1 comma X2. And for now, Let's uh, stick to the semi-honest setting. We will assume both the parties are curious, but they are honest. They follow the protocol instructions exactly as they are told. And later on, we will see how to use, uh, for example, like again, zero knowledge proofs and coin flipping to go to the malicious setting. But uh, yeah. Uh, let's just have semi-honest adversaries in mind right now, okay? And so rather than describing the whole protocol, let me describe the key component, which is the garbled circuit protocol, right? So normally, uh, how do you, how might we compute this function f if we don't need any kind of security? Maybe uh, P1 sends the input X1 to P2, right? P2 will evaluate the whole circuit on these inputs X1 and X2, and then compute the output, right? But here the problem of course, is that P2 learns uh, the input X1, which is something that we don't want. So how can P2 evaluate or execute the circuit without learning X1? So maybe what we need to do is we need to sort of uh, execute the circuit in an encrypted way or in a garbled way, right? So that's, that's where the name garbled circuit comes from, okay? So we will make some, maybe some simplifying assumptions. So let's say we have, uh, we are given a circuit, uh, Maybe let's denote the circuit by C for the function F, right? The circuit has only NAND gates. So 
So note that NAND gates are universal gates. Given a NAND gate, you can construct any other gate, including AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate, and uh, you know whatever. So any circuit can be represented as a circuit consisting only of NAND gates. For simplicity, that's what we will do. And we will assume that the circuit is polynomial sized. It has a polynomial number of wires, polynomial number of, uh, of gates. So let's try to draw maybe some sample circuit. All these are NAND gates. So there are many wires in this circuit, okay? And I'm just giving you a high level overview of the whole construction right now. We will go into more formal details. So, so in garbled circuits, there's a person who prepares the garbled circuit and then there's a person who evaluates the garbled circuit, okay? So P1 is the sender of the garbled circuit, P2 is the receiver or the evaluator. Now, as the first step, let's look at every wire in the circuit. And what we will do is we will generate two keys for every wire, two random keys. So for each wire W, pick two keys, let's call them um, KW0 and KW1. Okay, and these are keys for encryption scheme, like for, for AES or for, for whatever, right? <clears throat> and then next, uh, so what do these keys represent? Whenever you are evaluating a circuit, right? You start with some input, you go through the whole circuit. Uh, every wire will either turn out to be zero or will turn out to be one, right? So here KW0 represents the value on that wire being zero. KW1 represents the value on that wire being one. Okay, so the receiver will learn exactly one key for each input wire. I'm not telling you how uh, so far. So using that, let me denote the receiver as R. Using that, R can go through the whole circuit and learn uh, 
one key for each wire each intermediate wire so you start with one key for each input wire somehow that allows you to sort of uh, compute one key for each intermediate wire and then one key for each output wire so hence r gets one key for each output wire which allows him to get the output so r learns only the output and the output alone r doesn't learn the input so that's sort of the high level mechanism which we are interested in sort of implementing and now let's see how we do that okay so <clears throat> the garbled circuit consists of the following components the first part is for each wire w um sender picks kw0 and kw1 okay next and this is for every wire input wire intermediate wire output wire next is what is known as encrypted gate tables so so suppose sender gets one key for each input wire right next we would like to to let the sender learn the relevant key for this wire for the next wire and how does the sender do that how, how does the receiver do that so receiver has uh, two keys here and we want receiver to learn the right key for the intermediate wires so encrypted gate tables allow you to do that so okay so let's let's write the truth table for the nand function so the input could be 0 0 0 1 10 or 11 right so this is let's say i this is wire number j and let's call this l wire number l so i and j are the input wires l is the output wire so what is 0 0 and of 0 0 is 0 so 1 and all the rest are sorry so and of 0 comma 1 is also 0 so 1 1 1 and 0 and this is for the following gate this is wire number i this is wire number j this is wire number l so given k i 0 k j 0 and
R should learn K L um, K L one. Okay. So if the two inputs are zero and zero, the output is one and hence you should learn KL1 and so on. So how do we, how do we uh, ensure this? There's a question, what do subscripts of KI and KJ mean? Superscripts. So we have, uh, so this is the value on the ith wire. And this is the value on the jth wire. So there are two possible values, either zero or one, and hence we have two keys. So for this, we will simply use encryption, right? Using encryption, we will make sure that if you have ki zero and kj zero, you get kl one. So the gate table looks something like the following. Encryption under KI zero, and we will use double encryption. Encryption under KJ zero of, uh, okay, so this is the key. Let me write the key as an input, okay. So K I zero comma, what is the message that you encrypt? The message is another uh, ciphertext. K J zero and K L one, okay. Let me write down the whole table. So each encrypted gate table will have four entries. So this is KJ one. And what should this be here? What should I encrypt? If the receiver has these two keys, which key should the receiver learn? So here we need to look at this table of the NAND gate. So this is still one, KL1. KJ0 and this would still be KL1. So this is the key and this is the message that you learn if you have this key. KI1, KJ1 and okay, so this is the gate table for the gate represented by i, j, and l. Each gate is represented by uh, three wires, two input wires and one output wire, right? Any questions? The last one should be, yeah, good, thank you. So if you have two keys, depending upon which two keys you have, you get exactly one uh, output wire key. Any questions? So now observe the following, that if the receiver gets one key for each input wire and the receiver gets all these encrypted gate tables. The receiver can learn uh, the keys for the output wires. 
corresponding to the right value. But how does the receiver get the actual output, right? The receiver can get the keys, but what do the keys correspond to? So the last component in a garbled circuit is what is known as uh, output decoding table. So normally when you get some key, you don't know what it corresponds to. Does it correspond to zero? Does it correspond to one? I don't know, right? But I need to learn the output. So that's why um, the receiver is also given this output decoding table, which uh, just uh, does the following. For each output wire, Uh, the table consists of just the following. For each output wire W, the table is KW0 corresponds to zero and KW1 corresponds to one. And what does the garbled circuit uh, or what does the receiver get? All encrypted gate tables, all output decoding tables, And only one key for each input wire. Receiver doesn't get uh, both the keys for the input wires. So receiver starts with one key for each input wire. Receiver evaluates, goes through the whole garbled circuit for each intermediate wire, the receiver learns exactly one key for each wire. So receiver gets the keys corresponding to the output wires. And then receiver just looks up what the output is supposed to be given the output decoding table. So that's the whole idea. Now the question is, how does the receiver get only one key for each input wire? Because the sender of course doesn't know receiver's input. So how does that work? That's the question. So any, any clarifications, any questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. I'll try to use this, this board. So now let me describe to you the whole protocol for two-party computation using garbled circuits. As uh, the first step, P1 prepares the whole garbled circuit. What do I mean by whole garbled circuit? P1 picks all the wire keys, two keys for each wire. P1 prepares the encrypted gate table. P1 prepares the output decoding table. 
one is not sending anything to p2 yet and note that there are wire keys corresponding to input x1 okay p1 sends all those to p2 okay so there are some input wires in the circuit which are for the input x1 input x1 is known to p1 so p1 sends uh, one of the two keys corresponding to what x1 is now what about x2 how does p1 send the wire keys corresponding to x2 here we will use oblivious transfer for x2 how <clears throat> um so let's let's think about the first bit of x2 for each bit of x2 <clears throat> p2 x as the sender uh, of the oblivious transfer so we are using one out of two string oblivious transfer so say this is the this is the wire index w so p1 prepares kw0 and kw1 and this is p1's input p2's input is x21 the first bit of x2 and what does p2 learn p2 learns kw x21 okay so p1 doesn't learn p2's input but p2 learns exactly one of the two keys corresponding to what his input is and then you repeat for all bits of x2 so shouldn't it be p1 learns kw x2 of 1 no p2 p2 is the um okay 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 double circuit p1 prepares the garbage circuit so at the end of this step p2 has exactly one key for each input wire so p2 is ready to start evaluating the garbage circuit and at this stage p1 sends all uh
get tables and output decoding table. Right, so So using this P2 can learn the output. P2 gets the output. So this is a slightly oversimplified version and there, there's a couple of problems which I am, uh, um, I am sort of hiding under the rug, which we'll talk about. But this is sort of the basic mechanism, the, good, the basic starting point. Any questions? So like at the end, P2 will just transfer F of X1 comma X2 to P1. Yeah, let's say only P2 needs to get the output just for simplicity. If both parties need the output, then the second party can send the output to the first party. So how do we argue that P2 doesn't learn for example, P1's input. So it seems that it's easy to argue that P1 is not learning anything, right? Because P1 prepares the garbage circuit, P1 sends everything. P1 doesn't, le doesn't le really receive any messages from P2 except for messages in oblivious transfer, right? But in oblivious transfer, anyway, sender doesn't get anything, right? So this whole protocol is essentially zero knowledge for P1. But what about P2? Right, given these encrypted gate tables, given all the keys, maybe P2 can figure out <coughs> P1's input. So what is the issue here? The issue is this gate table, right? So suppose, uh, you know, let's take an example here. Suppose this is a gate. I and J are the input wires and I and J correspond to the input x1, right? Now P2 is not supposed to learn x1. But P2 has these two keys. P2 looks at the gate table and starts decrypting these four entries. Suppose P2 is successful in decrypting the first entry. What does P2 learn? If P2 is successful in decrypting the first entry, then uh, P2 learns that value on I comma J is zero comma zero. And hence the value on L is one. Right, so this is the first problem. P2 should not learn whether the given key corresponds to zero or one, right? So that's something we need to make sure. P2 shouldn't. what bit the key corresponds to. 
P2 should just, just learn a bit, sorry, P2 should just learn a key and shouldn't be clear, does it correspond to zero or one? Um, there, there's a couple of questions. In part two, it says that P2 acts as the sender. Oh, P1 is acting as the sender. P2 acts as the receiver. So these are senders input, two keys. And P2 is the receiver, P2's input is this bit D. I think P1 knows the whole garbage circuit, so it could choose the input according to X1 and send to P2. Yeah, that's right. So P1 prepares the whole garbage circuit and P1 has X1. So P1 can send the keys corresponding to X1 to P2 directly. The problem only comes when we are looking at X2 because X2 is unknown to P1. And here you get the keys uh, using oblivious transfer. And oblivious transfer really fits in very nicely here because uh, there are two keys for every wire and you are supposed to get only one of them, right? This is exactly what oblivious transfer sort of allows you to do. So how do we fix this problem? <coughs> right? P2 uh, gets some keys. Uh, P2 shouldn't learn the mapping between the key and the bit, except for the output. So any ideas on how we can fix this problem? So what about randomly permuting this table? This is my sign for random permutation. Here the problem was that the first entry corresponds to the input being zero, zero, second entry is zero, one, and so on. So what, what if just, we just like shuffle the table? Does that solve the problem? Okay, there is, there is a thought that yes, should solve the problem. Any other thoughts? So if you shuffle the table, uh, now I have two keys, right? I have no idea which of these four entries I should be decrypting. I can try to decrypt all four, I will probably get some junk one of the entries will be decrypted successfully and I'll get the right key. For the other entries, I'll probably get some, some random looking number. So how do I know uh, which of the four entries I should decrypt? <clears throat> so this problem is actually not very hard to solve. I try to decrypt all the four entries. We just need a mechanism to make sure that I know which of the decryptions is correct, right? So to do that, we sort of make the message identifiable. So what we should do here is just maybe append or concatenate a bunch of zeros to the message. So now this is our new gate table. The entries are randomly permuted. 
and I have two keys. I try to decrypt all the four entries. One of them I will, I will decrypt successfully and I'll see a bunch of zeros. Then I know that, yeah, this is the one which does make sense. For the rest, I am probably going to get some garbage and definitely not a bunch of zeros. So this solution works. And this is essentially a complete solution for the Yahoo garbage circuit. But like there is always a possibility that you get some zeros with some other garbage value, right? Yeah, the possibility of that we would have to argue is negligible, assuming that the number of zeros which you put is large enough. No, no, but, but the point is that like the cryptography violation, like the security violation can be probabilistic, but this would lead to a correctness violation with like, this will be probabilistically correct only then like that's yeah, that's a very good observation. And that is true. So this construction, which I described right now, it's uh, yeah, it, it does have some correctness error. And there's another construction, not very hard, which, uh, which is maybe you know slightly more complex, uh, which which solves this problem. Thank you, sir. Just to give you a very brief idea of what the other construction looks like, um, <clears throat> in the other construction, uh, you randomly shuffle the table. Um, but when you encrypt the keys, you also sort of encrypt some sort of identifier, which allows you to pick one of these four entries. That's a very high level idea. Okay. Okay, good. So note that this protocol only has security against semi-honest adversaries. What if uh, P1 is malicious? It's very easy for P1 to send a wrong garbage circuit for some other function maybe. And uh, you know, you end up accepting the wrong output. That's one of the problems. Uh, yeah, actually that is really the main problem here. So how do we solve this, this issue? And the idea is again, uh, we will just use uh, zero knowledge proofs. So what about malicious parties? And again, use zero knowledge plus coin flipping. We have already looked at the GMW compiler. With the zeros approach, can't we just detect that two of the messages have zeros concatenated and rerun the entire uh, process? That's also a good suggestion. But in that case, the running time of your protocol becomes expected polynomial time rather than just polynomial time. Okay, <clears throat> so now, even if the probability is negligible, yeah. Yeah, because there's no, um, I mean like, because there's no like fixed upper bound here. So you can only sort of um, analyze the average running time of the protocol or the expected running time of the protocol. I cannot really say that, hey, yeah, this is the this is a polynomial bound, and I'm pretty sure that the protocol will stop uh, within that. There's always some small negligible probability that protocol will will go beyond that. Now, 
right so this uh, yaws garbag circuit this is actually really the first secure two party competition protocol which was ever proposed and very interestingly this this is still the most efficient secure two party competition protocol at least for semi honest parties the protocol is just so simple you need uh, just based on the size of the circuit of course you need to prepare a bunch of encryptions um encryption uh, a bunch of encryptions like four encryptions per gate and you don't need even you don't even need public key encryption here just private key encryption which can be aes is good enough and aes is very fast especially when you do it in hardware you can encrypt like gigabytes of messages per second and then you need bunch of oblivious transfers uh, which only depend upon how large your input is and again that's also not something which is which is slow right so the only problem is when you go to malicious parties sure we can use zero knowledge and we can use coin flipping but think about uh, zero knowledge right so think about this whole uh, sort of message which p1 is sending for the whole circuit p1 is preparing like a garbled circuit and p1 needs to prove that this uh, this garbled circuit is constructed correctly so just imagine taking this whole computation and converting it into an instance of graph three curling problem that is going to be hopeless right it will be polynomial time but uh, you know i don't know maybe it will take like hours if not days so can we do something more efficient yeah there have been like if not 100 maybe like dozens of papers on this and the very very basic idea is uh, is is something like the following i'll not go into like full details but even before using the inputs p1 prepares many garbled circuits so garbled circuit 1 garbled circuit 2 up to garbled circuit n what do i mean by garbled circuit just the gate tables and the output decoding table nothing related to the input and now the concern that p2 has is what if some or maybe all of these garbled circuits are constructed incorrectly uh, to sort of force a wrong output on p2 so then p2 chooses let's say uh, a random subset of these garbled circuits let's say half of these garbled circuits and p1 opens the chosen garbled circuits what do i mean by opens p1 reveals the whole randomness both the keys all the internal randomness and then p2 can verify if the garbled circuit is constructed correctly in particular p2 can verify that this uh, this gate table indeed corresponds to the nand gate and uh, the whole whole logic of the garbled circuit is correct and then p2 has some confidence in the remaining garbled circuit if all these chosen garbled circuits were honest then execute the remaining garbled circuits on the private inputs maybe a small number of them would be uh, would be bad would be malicious but then you can take the majority of the take majority output you see the output of all of them well you know that maybe like a couple of them might give you wrong output but uh, majority of them will give you the correct output and then you just uh, you just uh, take the output which is given by a majority of them 
This is because if a majority of these garbled circuits were dishonest, when you choose a random subset with very high probability, you will detect that some garbled circuits are dishonest. So just on this idea alone, there have been like dozens of papers on really like optimizing all the different parameters and, and making sure that you get an efficient construction. So now let's look at the multi-party setting. And again, we'll go back to the semi-honest setting. So here we have parties P1 having input X1, P2 has input X2 and so on. And then we have Pn having input Xn and the parties are interested in evaluating the function F of X1, X2 up to Xn. And here is the high level uh, idea. So as the first step, P1 prepares the garbage circuit for the function or for the circuit F. Now the next step is P1 sends wire keys uh, corresponding to X1 to let's say Pn. So we need to pick one party who will do the whole evaluation of the garbage circuit. So P1 is the, is the creator of the garbage circuit. Pn will be the evaluator of the garbage circuit. So what do we do with the, with the remaining parties? So P2 to Pn execute one out of two oblivious transfers with P1 to learn wire keys corresponding to inputs X2 to Xn respectively, right? So for example, P2 will start, P2 has X2. So P2 will run the oblivious transfer with P1 and, get, and then get the keys corresponding to X2. And by the way, here I should mention P P1 sends wire keys corresponding to X2, X1 to Pn uh, privately. We are assuming that every pair of parties can talk uh, privately. And then P2 to Pn minus one send wire keys corresponding x2 to xn minus 1 to pn. Okay, so all the parties in the middle p2 to pn minus 1, they got wire keys corresponding to their inputs and then they all send all these wire keys to pn. And again, this is done privately. In particular, uh, P1 doesn't learn what these guys are sending to Pn. Now, 
Now Pn next P1 sends um, get tables and output decoding table to Pn. So now Pn has everything necessary to evaluate the Gabriel circuit. Pn has all the wire keys for all the input wires and uh, Pn gets the gate tables, the output decoding table. So Pn can sort of go through the whole circuit and Pn now gets the function output. F of x1, x2, up to xn. And then Pn can announce this function output to all other parties if required. So good. Now let's, now let's look at every individual party. What do they learn? So what does P1 learn? Well, P1 really learns nothing, right? P1 is the sender of the garbage circuit and P1 acts, the send, acts as the sender in every oblivious transfer. So P1 doesn't really learn anything in the protocol. Let's look at P2 to Pn minus one. Okay, let me write it down, P1. learns nothing really. P2 to Pn minus one, what do they learn? One random key for each of their input bits. And then this, that these random keys are sent to, to Pn, right? So P2 to Pn minus one, they are also not learning any useful information, just learning a random string. What does P1 learn? Pn, um, one wire key for each input wire. And then Pn can start sort of evaluating the circuit, which means that Pn can then decrypt and recover one wire key for every wire in the circuit. But Pn has no idea what this wire key corresponds to. Does it correspond to zero? Maybe it corresponds to one. I don't know, right? So this is not useful information. Pn is just learning a bunch of random numbers until this point. Then Pn decodes the output given the output decoding table. And that's really the only useful information which Pn is learning. So Pn only learns the output and nothing else. So that's fine. Uh, of course, Pn was supposed to learn just the output. So this is just a very high level intuition. The actual formal proof of the garble circuit construction, it's, it's uh, pretty long. Um, this is not something that we will cover in the course. Okay, any questions? 
So here, uh, it's good to be aware of the limitation of uh, this construction. What if P1 and Pn collude? What happens? Can they learn the input of any other party or can they break the security in any other way? And why? So there are multiple yeses in the chat, but, but how? Yeah, PN can send the keys to P1, yeah, and learn the input of P2 to PN minus one. Yeah, very good. So for example, let's look at the party P2, right? Party P2 got the wire key corresponding to his input X2. And that was sent to PN. So PN doesn't know what this wire key correspond to, which bit, but P1 knows. Right, because P1 is the party who constructed the whole Gabriel circuit. P1 exactly knows which wire key corresponds to which bit. So together, Pn and P1 can decode the input x2, can dec decode the input x3, and so on. So if these parties collude, they can learn the input of every other party. And by the way, this is a problem even in the semi-honest setting. These parties don't need to deviate from the protocol, right? They can be honest throughout the protocol and sort of look at their random strings which they have recorded in the protocol and then can figure out all the inputs. So there's not secure as with each other. And uh, yeah, in that case, we need to use something different. Uh, this is not something which we will cover, but there's a protocol which is known as the GMW protocol. Well, really there are like hundreds of protocols. The protocol which we are covering in the class, uh, they are really from the 80s. Um, they are more advanced uh, MPC protocols. So we do have secure multi-party computation protocols for any function, which are secure even if n minus one parties can be corrupted and can collude with each other. So this is a very strong uh, sort of security. And we do have protocols for these. Okay, good. So since we have uh, some time left, let me briefly touch uh, a few topics which we didn't cover in the class. Any, any final questions about MPC? So there's a question, I don't quite understand the construction for, do you mean malicious parties or multiple parties? Why does it help to send multiple garbled circuit? Oh, so you're talking about, uh, you're talking about this construction. Yeah, so, so what is the problem for malicious parties? The key problem, is uh, what if P1 is malicious? 
if p1 is malicious p1 can prepare a wrong garbled circuit which can give you the wrong output right this is really a problem with correctness it's not a problem with learning the input or it's not a problem with the security as such so you can yeah you can prove that one garbled circuit is fine but we were trying to get a more efficient construction we were trying to avoid the use of uh, zero knowledge proofs because zero knowledge proofs will require np reduction like converting the whole computation to an instance of graph three coloring and that's not something that we want to do so this construction doesn't require any np reduction it's known as uh, it's known as a uh, cut and choose based construction p1 prepares multiple garbled circuits p2 inspects a few of them and if they all pass the test p2 automatically assumes that yeah most of the rest are fine as well this is something which we use in real life all the time of course so p1 opening the choose chosen garbled circuit doesn't involve zero knowledge proofs yes it doesn't involve zero knowledge proof um what does opening the the garbled circuit mean p1 will send all the wire keys both wire keys for every input wire so p1 essentially discloses the whole randomness which was used in constructing the garbled circuit because here we don't need to hide anything we will not use these chosen garbled circuits we have not started using the private input yet so p1 reveals the whole randomness p2 goes through and p2 makes sure that garbled circuit was constructed correctly we don't need zero knowledge here because uh, there is nothing to hide at this point okay good so one of the very important important topics and there are like semester long courses just on this topic alone is known as fully homomorphic encryption so the example that i like to give is maybe there's a server which is very powerful maybe think about a cloud right and then there is a client so client has maybe some some uh, data so let's call this data x so maybe client wants to do some expensive computation on this data so there's a function f maybe it takes a few hours client wants to compute f of x maybe you know some some genome sequencing or something you can imagine some expensive computation so client is interested in hiring the server so client goes to the server client says i have this data i need some computation f done on it right um the server says yeah that's fine uh this computation will be like 100 client says yeah that's fine the price is okay server says okay i am ready please send me uh, your input x and client says sorry my my input is is private it's confidential i cannot give it to you and then and then server might uh, just just say that uh, you are stupid you know <laughs> how can i compute on your data unless you send the data to me okay so in this case it turns out that client is actually not that stupid there's something that you can do what you can do is client can just send some kind of encryption of the data to the server server can do computation on this encrypted data without decrypting the data and server can send encryption of f of x to the client and client has the secret key client can decrypt and recover uh the output f of x so this is this can also be seen as computing on encrypted data and it turns out fully homomorphic encryption allows you to do arbitrary computation on encrypted data like maybe you have a python program which you want to run on some data you can take the data in the encrypted format run the whole arbitrarily powerful program on it so that's something something you know almost seems like should be impossible 
So fully homomorphic encryption allows you to do that. It was introduced by um, Craig Gentry in uh, 2009. So not something which is relatively recent. The problem of fully homomorphic encryption was around since, since uh, the 70s or the 80s, but actually building a fully homomorphic encryption was an open problem for the longest time, for like three decades. And then Craig Gentry actually was a PhD student at Stanford and he was taking a class on cryptography uh, by Dan Bonet. And uh, this was a problem which was mentioned as an open problem in that class. And uh, the professor uh, Bonet basically promised like um, an immediate PhD to anybody who would solve the problem. And uh, Gentry probably thought that that's the easiest way to get a PhD and Gentry solved the problem and did get a PhD from Stanford. And that was a huge breakthrough in the area. And uh, fully homomorphic encryption uses something which is known as lattice-based uh, cryptography. And uh, it shouldn't look that surprising or, or that magical because we have seen some kind of homomorphic encryption at least, right? We have seen that, for example, El Gamal is already multiplicatively homomorphic. You can take, an, take something encrypted under El Gamal. You can, uh, you can take two ciphertexts and compute the multiplication of these or you can take a single ciphertext and you can multiply the message with some kind of constant, if you know what the constant is. So yeah, so the multiplication gates are fine. And uh, what does some arbitrary computation consists of? It consists of some multiplication gates, maybe some addition gates, right? So if you can do multiplication and addition um, in a single uh, encryption system, you are already very close to fully homomorphic encryption. So that was sort of the idea. And uh, since uh, Gentry proposed a, a construction in 2009, there have been several improvements. Um, this is still a very active area of uh, research in cryptography. And as you can imagine, this, this is something which is very useful for cloud computing, right? So maybe you don't trust the cloud, but you do want the cloud to do something for you. And in that case, you can dump your data in the encrypted format. Cloud doesn't learn anything confidential, but cloud can still do anything that you want uh, on this data. Another uh, problem is sort of the very opposite of this. Fully homomorphic encryption allows you to do arbitrary computations. There's something known as non-malleable encryption, or you can even have non-malleable commitments. So to, to motivate the problem, think about an, an auction, right? So we have um, a seller, let's say Alice is selling maybe a phone. Okay, not a very good picture, but uh, it's fine. And then we have Bob, uh, who is interested in bidding on the phone. And let's say we are interested in sealed auctions. So everybody will, and Alice has, has let's say public key. So everybody will submit their bid to Alice encrypted under this public key. Let's say uh, Bob wants to bid uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, let's say M. M is a number, maybe like $100, right? And then we have this uh, adversary, uh, Trudy. Trudy wants to bid just a little bit more than Bob and uh, win the auction. So Prudy, Trudy, of course, cannot decrypt this message. Uh, Trudy doesn't have the secret key, only Alice does. But maybe Trudy can take this ciphertext and then maybe do some kind of computation on this ciphertext and then prepare another ciphertext C, C prime, which is exactly an encryption of maybe M plus one, right? Or maybe 1.01 .01 times 
m and uh, if you have some sort of homomorphic encryption this is definitely possible in el gamal for example i can uh, take this cipher text i can multiply the message by let's say 101 divided by 100 and then what i am likely to end up getting is something which is just slightly higher than m maybe not m plus 1 some m prime just slightly higher so so definitely algamal encryption is not good algamal commitment is also not good um so what you really need here is what is known as non malleable commitment or non malleable encryption so given encryption of pk comma m should be hard to compute encryption of pk comma m prime for any m prime which is related to m right related i am not defining what related means right so of course uh, it's a public key encryption right you can take a completely fresh message m prime and you can encrypt it but what i want is if i am encrypting some message m your cipher text should be independent of my cipher text and if you have that then uh, we can solve the problem of auction and there has been a lot of research turns out to be not that easy uh, it's probably easier to design encryption schemes with some algebraic structure which allows you to do some computation but if you want to block all computation you know given some cipher text cannot compute any other cipher text that turns out to be very hard so yeah there has been a lot of work uh, probably again dozens of of research papers on non malleable encryption non malleable commitments and and so on so this might be a stupid question but like isn't one time pad although one time pad we can't use but is one time pad non malleable no not at all in one time pad for example i take the cipher text i flip a bit and that flips uh, the corresponding bit of the message but like uh, you, okay you are saying that will yeah sorry sorry yeah that gives you a message m prime which is very related to m right m prime and m would be the same except they will differ in exactly one bit if you flip the first bit of the cipher text m prime and m will be the same except in the first bit okay what else uh let's talk about uh program obfuscation It's again a very exciting topic so program obfuscation is a very old problem in computer science and the problem is that uh, maybe there's a software vendor let's call this vendor v and then there's a user u right so maybe the software vendor has some sort of program p and the vendor would like to send this program uh to the user but user should not be able to reverse engineer this program user should be able to run this program on any input of uh, his choice but should not learn anything else except uh the output right so send maybe some some sort of obfuscated version of the program p you can learn p of x for any x and maybe even for multiple inputs but nothing more than that so it's a very natural problem 
um it's a very hard problem um in fact in in <clears throat> there was a paper of uh, barak et al uh, this was in 2001 which showed that program obfuscation is impossible in particular this sort of intuition which i am talking about that sort of giving the program to you is 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 similar to giving an oracle you can query the oracle you can get the response but nothing about the code so this type of uh, this this type of definition is impossible to realize unconditionally so that was very negative and in fact uh, you know um we didn't really have any good positive result on program obfuscation for a long time but then uh, maybe like like 7 years ago in 2013 there was a new and weaker definition so people realized that we shouldn't be that ambitious right inherently something will be leaked but can be sort of minimize what is leaked so people sort of weakened the definition of uh, of program obfuscation and then uh, people were able to build Uh, program obfuscation the the current uh, program obfuscation schemes they are very inefficient so there's a lot more work that is required but uh, it's also a very fast moving and very exciting area of cryptography and again lattice based cryptography plays an important role let me look at the questions uh, can encrypting two times give some form of non malleability for in simple encryption schemes um yeah i'm not sure uh, how does encrypting twice work i mean like for example if i encrypt the same message twice in algamal i can multiply both the cipher text by 101 by divided by 100 no i mean uh, encrypting uh say just like in garbled circuits we encrypted the encrypted value ah okay mm, not really like yeah that's a good good start but turns out to be very difficult to prove that uh, you cannot do anything okay yeah i don't have a good answer like i cannot give you an argument and you will be immediately convinced that yeah encrypting twice doesn't work so most of the time it's like a lot of manual work but generally like people find some algebraic property uh, which you can exploit and that allows you to sort of change the message inside okay so we will stop here uh, for today and i am still around for questions thank you professor